And a lot of you were like, okay, how come she's never said anything about your friendship? Because I have dirt on everyone, and they know to keep their mouths shut. Well, maybe if she wasn't wearing the wrong foundation color, I wouldn't have to splash no battery acid. I wanted to lighten her skin tone, girl. And for you to use such a huge platform to say things that are not true and to get the response you knew you were going to get is so disheartening and so vicious. I know this may sound shocking coming from my mouth, but when you accept that you are the problem, you can become the solution. Hey guys, and welcome to today's video where we are gonna be talking about someone who I have wanted to cover ever since I started doing this series. I think he has had one of the wildest and most interesting career trajectories out of anyone who is on YouTube at the moment. And that is, of course, Jeffree Star. I have already made a video before about the downfall of Jeffree Star Cosmetics, his brand, but this is gonna be about Jeffree Star the person. So if you've already watched that video, then this is gonna be something different. So don't worry about hearing everything repeated. This is going to be probably the longest video I've ever done just because there is so much stuff that has gone on with Jeffree's career. So without further ado, let's get into the rise and downfall of Jeffree Star. To start off with, Jeffree Star was born on November 15th, 1985, making him 36 years old right now. And his career started as soon as he graduated high school in Orange County, California in 2002. Jeffree has said that he experimented with makeup through high school and his early life and had been wearing it to school since junior high. Straight after graduating, he moved to Los Angeles to attempt to make a career for himself in the makeup world and in fashion and he worked behind a counter in Mac and doing other various jobs involving makeup such as private hire jobs for people and for celebrities. He also did some modeling and music jobs just to kind of support himself whilst he was trying to make his career take off. He joined MySpace in 2003, one year after moving to LA with the intention of promoting his music. However, his account gained masses of interest not because of his songs but because of his personality and his unique appearance. He regularly he regularly posted music and beauty related content alongside social commentaries on life, confidence and fame and became the most followed person on MySpace who was a non-artist by 2006 and frequently gained over 50,000 comments on each of his photos he posted to his account. He was also recognised as one of the most popular unsigned artists on the site, often making it into the top daily rankings, which helped him to kickstart a career in music after being encouraged to do so by his friend Samantha Maloney, who was the drummer in the band Peaches. Following his success on MySpace, Jeffrey was advertised as part of the True Colors tour in 2007, which traveled through 15 US cities and was sponsored by the LGBT badge and took place in June to coincide with Pride Month. As someone who was open about their sexuality and their life as a kind of androgynous man uh, and not fitting into the kind of stereotypical image of a rock star, Jeffrey was seemingly quite a good choice for this tour. And following the success of the tour, he actually released an album called Beauty Killer in 2009, which even featured a song with Nicki Minaj. And he signed onto the label Convict Music in 2010 and met the band Blood on the Dance Floor, who would take him on tour multiple times between 2010 and 2013. Although we're going to talk more about them and lead singer Darby Vanity later on, so just keep them in mind. Jeffrey abruptly left the music industry in 2013, citing legal issues with the label's owner, Akon, as the reason why, and he never released anything again, and later said that signing to that label was one of the biggest mistakes he'd ever made. So Jeffree Star Cosmetics was then founded in November 2014, with the remaining savings that he had from his music career and from his previous career as a makeup artist, and started with the release of three lipstick shades. They became known for their kind of out there colours, they were doing things that other brands were not, and made a name for themselves as the brand to go to if you wanted something a bit more bright and outlandish than the ordinary nudes, pinks, browns and reds that you would get from any other brand. There also weren't a lot of brands investing in liquid lipsticks at the time, so they did also stand out for that reason because that was their signature product. Jeffrey started to promote his brand through his YouTube channel, which had been created in 2006, but had only been posting music videos rather than personal content up until that point. And this form of marketing hadn't really been seen before. YouTube wasn't a massive platform, you know, it started to gain traction and it had a lot of viewers at that point, but people hadn't really seen someone using a YouTube channel 
purely to promote their kind of personal brand but it worked and Jeffree Star Cosmetics soon expanded into also making eyeshadows, bullet lipsticks, highlighters and accessories such as mirrors and bags and Jeffree's YouTube channel grew pretty quickly as did his brand reaching 1 million subscribers in April 2016 and then 3 million subscribers only 7 months later launching him into fame and fortune much greater than that of his MySpace and music career and in 2018, a Forbes article claimed that he had made $18 million off of his YouTube ventures alone, growing from 6 million subscribers at the start of the year to doubling that to 12 million subscribers by January 3rd, 2019. So the profits reaped from Jeffree Star Cosmetics would far exceed those of YouTube. And I'm not going to say any more about his brand because A, I already have a whole video about that and I don't want to repeat myself. And B, I don't want to make this video any longer than it needs to be when all of that information is already out on my channel. So what was interesting about Jeffrey's journey with his brand and his channel was the fact that he managed to amass what I like to call a cult following, who later on in his career would come to his defense over everything that he did, regardless of like how horrible it was, regardless of whether he confirmed that he'd done it or not. So Jeffrey's following is a very different dynamic to what a lot of beauty girls have because it feels less like his viewers just like his content and more like they see him as their kind of leader and like they very much admire and look up to him. So I would highly recommend everyone watch Liam McAvoy's video about the sociology of kind of the cult followings that some influencers amass. It explains how and why they form with references to religious sociology. I'm not going to try and paraphrase what he said because I don't know anything about religious sociology and I feel like I would leave out important bits if I did try to. So I would say just go and watch that video because it's a really good kind of general explanation of how and why these kind of cult followings form around certain influencers. Trust me, it's good and there's a lot of details in there that you wouldn't expect if you haven't studied the topic before. So whilst I don't want to dive into why these cult followings form generally, I do want to have a look at why people were drawn to Jeffree Star specifically. So Jeffree was far from the first beauty girl on YouTube. Like people like Tati and Jack and Hill had been on the platform for longer than him. So it wasn't a situation of novelty in terms of content, like makeup tutorials had reigned supreme back in like 2010. Um, however, his personality was what set him apart. So remember, Jeffrey had grown to be the most followed person on MySpace, having been a complete nobody before then. So clearly there was something about him that was drawing people to him just based off of his personality because MySpace was basically his personality and his music. What I think that was, was a complete lack of filter. Like people praised him for being honest and being kind of unapologetically himself. Even when he was being problematic, people are like, oh, well, that's just Jeffrey. You know, he's at least not trying to hide it and he kind of seemed to be the opposite of all the other like picture perfect Pinterest beauty gurus who embodied everything that everyone else wanted to be but couldn't think like Zoella for example everything in her life was seen through rose colored glasses whereas Jeffrey was brash and honest about everything and was basically the complete opposite to her he had an interesting look and good makeup skills to match. Whilst everyone else was making like copper smoky eye tutorials, Jeffrey was painting his face with brightly coloured lipsticks and he was offering something that no one else was doing both in terms of himself and in his content. This was the same as kind of Tana Mojo, for example. She was like the anti-lifestyle guru because she was so opposite to people like Alicia Marie and Lord DIY. Jeffrey was the same where he was the opposite to all of the other beauty gurus so people were drawn to him because he felt more real. People valued his opinions because he wasn't overly positive about everything except for his own products of course and even then it seemed authentic and so he became the kind of go-to YouTuber for honest reviews and he was offering something you couldn't get elsewhere so people would become attached to him and his content because they didn't feel like other people were being as real or authentic with them. So because of his kind of unapologetic unapologetically me image people would then excuse him when he would be nasty to other people or about other people saying oh well that's just Jeffrey you know he has no filter at least he's not being two-faced or fake and because they liked how honest he was about other things they were kind of thinking it would be hypocritical to call him out for being honest about his opinions on other people to their face or behind their back so he started to kind of get away with making these like nasty comments about everyone else or online outbursts because his fans thrived off of him being messy so they would stand him when he was doing things like this rather than condemning him. This obviously then led to him getting away with a lot more later on because fans started to excuse kind of more and more and more as they grew more attached to him and he started doing more 
bad things. And this kind of built up this fan base of followers who were in awe of him and uh, admired him, so they wouldn't want to say anything against him. I do also think there was a slight element of fear for speaking out against him for some people because it did not matter if you were another beauty guru, if you were a celebrity, if you were just a random person on the internet, if you spoke about out up against Jeffrey, there was really nothing stopping him from clapping back at you. Like he would clap back at everyone regardless of who they were so people didn't want to end up in the firing line and receive a ton of hate from his other fans and the first time he ever really got told off for his behavior was not until 2016 when someone with a voice in the makeup community finally spoke out against him so jeffrey's first ever internet-wide scandal came with his fallout with kat von d in 2016 which interesting side note has been credited by some people as the kind of start of drama youtube i found that in some sources that i use for my drama and commentary channels video that they were saying Saying that people didn't really start reporting on drama and digging into drama until this happened and so they kind of credited him for that but that's kind of irrelevant to Jeffrey's career journey that's just an interesting side note so to give a brief history of their friendship Jeffrey emailed Kat to ask if she would do two tattoos for him on his sleeve of Marilyn Monroe and Sharon Tate because Kat was a well-known tattoo artist at the time she had her own studio and she had her own show called LA Inc Kat responded and agreed and asked Jeffrey to feature on LA Inc and get the tattoo which he agreed and he did feature on the show in, in two episodes in 2010 leading to the two of them becoming close friends Kat has started her makeup line back in 2008 and was pretty established as a makeup guru and as a makeup curator, whereas Jeffrey didn't start his company until late 2014. And the two were seen together on multiple occasions. They seemed like genuinely good friends. Until 2016, where out of the blue, Kat made an Instagram post where she called out Jeffrey and said that she would no longer be friends with him. And her statement read, after years of making excuses for and rationalizing Jeffrey's inappropriate behavior, including promoting drug use, racism, and bullying, I can no longer hold my tongue after recent events. I know that over the years, many of you were introduced to Jeffrey through me. And regardless if you chose to continue to follow him or not, I would like, just like to disassociate myself from him and his brand from this point on. I plan on posting a video explanation as to why I felt compelled to make such a statement, but for the time being, I simply want to apologize to anybody and everybody who has ever had to deal with any of his negativity. And yes, with a heavy heart, I will be pulling the shade Jeffrey from my collection, sending extra love to everyone out here. So aside from her reasoning in her Instagram statement, she did go into more detail in a YouTube video uh, of Jeffrey basically not paying Kat's friend uh, BJ Betts for work that he did on the logo for Jeffree Star Cosmetics. She also claimed that she was in a large part responsible for creating his brand and for his brand's success because she had put him in contact with people who would help him and set up meetings with important people to help him get his brand off the ground. And aside from the issues that she's had with his brand, Kat also said she didn't agree with or support the way that Jeffrey lived his life and how he attacked and intimidated people who disagreed with him. Same day, Jeffrey made a series of tweets at Kat saying that she was just jealous of his makeup line, that they hadn't spoken in a year, but Kat then threatened to post text messages from two days ago. So he changed his story to say, they had texted two days ago but they generally weren't on speaking terms. Jeffrey then made his own response video where he said that he whilst Betts had done some sketches for the logo he'd chosen to go with someone else but Betts had been paid for the work that he had done. He also alleged that Kat had told Jared Blandino the owner of Too Faced that Jeffrey had tried to steal makeup ideas from her uh, to use for his brand, something that Kat had not mentioned in her video. She'd made out that the whole problem was the logo, but then behind the scenes she was telling other people that it was to do with her brand. And Jeffrey obviously denied that he tried to steal anything from Kat, uh, so we don't know whether this interaction actually happened or not, or whether this statement from Kat to Jared was true, because Jared has never actually spoken out about it. So Betts made a statement a few days later to say that the issue had been resolved amicably and he wouldn't make any more comments on it, so it's never really been confirmed who was telling the truth, whether he was paid before or whether he was paid after all of this happened, but either way he got paid so he was happy. And this kind of concluded the feud, there wasn't really much that happened after this apart from the occasional shade thrown from both sides, for example Jeffrey did a video called Full Face of Makeup Brands That Hate Me where he used some of Kat's products, but this was the first major drama that Jeffrey had with one of his friends and it was an indicator of what would be to come later on. So before we move on to the next significant career event, I want to make some honourable mentions for feuds that don't deserve that whole section because they're not that significant, but that still warrant a mention. I'm 
because they were significant in kind of building his character and his reputation for being like the messiest beauty guru. So Jeffrey became known from like 2015 onwards for his dramas, like scandals, outbursts that seemed to be kind of never ending. Uh, you know, wherever there was internet drama, you could guarantee that Jeffree Star would have something to say about it. And the first drama is with the owner of Lime Crime, Doe Deer, who Jeffrey befriended in 2010, but then they seemingly ended their friendship kind of behind the scenes, like they ended it quietly. The only thing Jeffrey said about it was when he posted in 2015 a screenshot from a tweet from 2010 from Lime Crime's account saying, so funny, we were just talking about how awful Jeffrey Star is and now we're on his page listening to his music. Honestly, I don't really know what that means, but Jeffrey obviously took that to heart because he then accused Doe Deer of befriending him so that he would promote her brand and get her more attention and called her delusional to which she never responded and that was just kind of the end of that. He then threatened makeup by Shayla in 2016 right before the Kat Von D drama by telling her that he would beat her to the f***ing ground to which Shayla responded tweeting that any man who encourages beating women should not be getting public support and his response was that she looks and sounds more like a man than him so she needs to relax and then called her a broke rat. And this whole situation happened because Jeffrey made a snapshot story talking about how Instagram models basically need to get off their high horse and Shayla took that to mean her and then tweeted out saying that basically implying he was two-faced by saying that a certain guru has a lot to say about her on social media but when they were on a brand trip together he was friendly to her face. Jeffrey then called her out for allegedly telling another beauty YouTuber that she should get filler because her face is uneven, which Shayla denied and called Jeffrey a bully. There was also the brief feud with Jared Blandino, the owner of Too Faced Cosmetics, after he tried in 2017 to imply that Too Faced had a monopoly on unicorn makeup, despite the fact that every brand in 2016 was making unicorn makeup. He tried to call out Tar and say like there's no unicorns in the Amazon. Um, Jeffrey then took to Twitter and threatened to expose the contract between Too Faced and Nikki Tutorials that had been put in place for her collaboration, where basically she had not been paid any commission, she'd only been paid a flat fee of $50,000 while Too Faced made over $1 million from that collection. The contract was never leaked and Jeffrey warned that a bloodbath was coming but nothing ever really happened after this. Um, the feud just kind of ended there and this is kind of an example of Jeffrey's need to get involved in every internet drama like this had absolutely nothing to do with him and yet he decided to bring this whole thing with the contract up when like Nikki did not want him to Nikki did not ask him to do that he did that anyway Nikki had not wanted this all to go down in the public eye or be a public discourse but Jeffrey made it a public opinion kind of poll what do you think about Too Faced and Nikki Tutorial's collaboration when she hadn't really wanted him to do that. And he mentioned how him and Nikki are not friends anymore during this, like no one really knew why. But when people called him out for using a video title similar to hers, that's when he claimed in a Snapchat that he had dirt on everyone in the beauty community and they knew to keep their mouths shut, which almost seemed like a vague threat to anyone who might want to speak out against him or expose any him for anything because at this point he was a fairly scary person to be going up against because of his loyal following and because of the fact that whatever drama he inserted himself into he seemed to be the one that would come out unscathed despite being fairly aggressive towards the other person i'm just going to move the camera a little bit is that better yeah i think i'm in the middle now okay so now we can get on to the downfall of jeffree star which it's a lot. So the downfall of Jeffree Star really started brewing in 2016 when old footage of him being racist and homophobic during his MySpace days resurfaced and people were obviously outraged. So the homophobia dated back to 2010 where he called Pink a dirty lesbian and called gay people annoying in an interview with Red River Noise which obviously has not aged very well um, and also joked about punching a girl and throwing drinks on her in nightclub and saying he's all about business usually but he likes to go out and this is just what happens when people talk which basically is saying like I will assault people if they talk badly about me again hasn't aged well really. Jeffrey's early career was really centered around outrage like he got known because he was outrageous, he was unusual, he said and did things that other people wouldn't dare to so he would say racist and homophobic things and pass it off like it's just another outrageous thing that Jeffree Star's done. Like I don't doubt that he knew that saying these things would bring him attention because it got people riled up so he made sure that, that videos of him being racist and being homophobic would make the rounds on the internet and get him out there to more people. 
And the racist behavior seemed to be mostly concentrated between 2004 and 2006 in videos where he would shout slurs at people just on the street. Like it wasn't in interviews or anything like that, but there were multiple occurrences of this happening. The worst of which being what looks like a live stream or like a comedy sketch in 2006, where he tells a black woman that he will throw battery acid on her to lighten her skin tone. And in his song from 2007, We Want Cunt, featuring the N word at only 22 seconds in. He didn't really address any of his past racist behavior until 2016 when a fan made a compilation video of every one of these instances that was caught on camera, which then spread pretty quickly around the internet. He'd been filmed call calling someone the N-word with a hard R, a poor Mexican, an ape, and all of these insults were seemingly directed at like random members of the public who happened to be walking by him in the street and annoy him in some way. And although the footage in that video was all from the past, he did have an interaction with Jackie Ina in April 2017, which implied that he still held those views. She made an anti-haul video on April 28th, 2017, claiming that she would never include his brand in one of her videos because she did not want to support someone who made derogatory comments towards black women. And then shortly after she posted screenshots proving that he had blocked her on Instagram following that video. He then called her an irrelevant rat and accused her of using his name for views. And her only response was to warn her audience away from supporting him because of how he addresses black women and their concerns over his past treatment of them. He made an apology video in 2017 where he talked about his racist past and said that he was embarrassed of who he was and how he behaved and he'd never stood for anything except self-love, self-expression and self-worth, which is a slightly odd thing to say. Like, could he not have just said, you know, yes, I was racist. I did not understand the implications of my words. I didn't understand what I was doing. I deeply regret that now. You know, I'm more educated and I know that what I did was wrong and I am never going to do that again like would that have not been enough rather than saying that he's always stood for inclusivity when this vi these videos are a direct contradiction to that statement he also doesn't ever directly apologize to jackie Ina for the comments that he made about her purely because she didn't feel comfortable supporting his brand when he had never addressed his previous racism and anyway like besides that with Jackie Ina, this apology video is actually very important because it's the reception to this was very good. The video has over 5 million views, 300,000 likes and 40,000 dislikes and the comments are turned off but the dislike to like ratio kind of shows just how positively this video was received by his fans. And I was even reading an article from 2015, so before this apology, where the author said that many people didn't think Jeffrey was racist for the battery acid comment because his best friend was black and he was just being immature. Like, people have been excusing his racism for years and we really wonder why he gets so much support on an apology video that's basically just full of waffle, saying he's changed without any proof. And this started a pattern where every time Jeffrey got involved in a big scandal, he would make a video like this where he says he's apologizing, but then the actions don't necessarily follow the words and we'll see two more videos like this very similar to the style of this video in the coming years but we're going to discuss them later. This whole experience of being cancelled over old video footage resurfacing was really a turning point in Jeffrey's career because it marked the start of where he realised that he could get away with pretty much anything so long as he made a video about it if it was that big of a deal and regardless of how genuine that video was his fans would still defend him. We all knew prior to this that Jeffrey had a strong following, but for him to get away with this many incidents of racism and homophobia without losing any fans showed how loyal his fan base were to him. And that's when people started to really realize that his fan base was like one of these cult followings. And there were a lot of people who weren't part of his cult, who were either casual viewers or didn't really know who he was or didn't really watch his video, who decided that following this, they did not want to support him or you know, watch his videos anymore. So he did lose some online support and there were a lot more people starting to dislike him and question whether he had really changed since he hadn't really brought, brought any of this up until he got exposed eight years later. So he did damage his image in a way because there was a lot more caution attached to being a supporter of Jeffree Star after this because a lot of people branded him a racist and decided like, we don't want to support him because he's a racist. And there were also text messages in 2018 exposed by his ex hairstylist, David Munoz, where he referred to Jackie Ina as a gorilla, which proved that he still had racist tendencies despite what he said in that video. And he still used derogatory terms to refer to black women in particular. And a lot of people then decided, you know what? He is a racist still, and we don't want to support him as a result of the clear lack of change that he claimed he'd gone through, which actually he clearly hasn't. 
and he was in the growth phase of his channel at this point and he wasn't as big as he is now so to have a portion of the internet branding you as a racist was not good for his career or his image so someone needed to do something about that and the someone who would do something about that was Shane Dawson. The resolution to the damage to Jeffrey's career was the release of the Secret World of Jeffree Star series curated by Shane Dawson, which was announced on July 4th, 2018 and premiered on August 1st, 2018. The series was basically a long documentary covering all aspects of Jeffrey's life from his makeup brand to his childhood to his personal life. And it proved a redemption arc to his reputation and his career as many people watched this and thought they could see a different side to him and began to think actually maybe he will wasn't as bad as they thought he was. And the series did incredibly well and amassed a total view count of 150 million views across five episodes. And one of the reasons I think this did so well was because this followed Shane's mega successful Tanacon documentary, which covered a drama that a lot of people were interested in getting to the bottom of. So it was exciting to see Shane playing investigator and looking into what actually happened. And with Jeffrey's series, it was still sold as a kind of deep dive docuseries, but instead of covering an event, it was covering all aspects of life of one of the most, if not the most, controversial beauty gurus on the platform. And everyone was interested to see Jeffrey kind of behind the scenes and see what happens in his life of luxury, even if they weren't necessarily a fan of his before the series. They also kind of expected to see some analysis of why Jeffrey is the way he is and get like a deeper look into what kind of person he is behind the scenes and behind that facade of being like problematic and messy and not caring what anyone thinks. The docuseries ended up being incredibly biased, presenting Jeffrey in a very positive light as someone who had learned from his mistakes and grown into a better person not that we'd ever heard that before, and Shane edited it in a way that would make the viewer believe all of these things that Jeffrey was saying. They talked about the makeup brand, about Jeffrey's personal life, about his childhood and how that affected him, and it subtly convinced the viewer that they'd been wrong about Jeffrey, and actually he was just misunderstood in the media. And conveniently, Shane doesn't call him out for his racism against Jackie Ina and the things he hasn't apologised for that came after his apology video. But considering Shane also had an extremely racist past on YouTube, he probably knew that he wasn't the one to be asking the difficult questions. At this point, Shane was like a god on YouTube and was a loved OG member of the community, so people truly believed he would not associate with someone and give them a platform unless he truly believed that they were a good person. Like, as we know now, he only really covered controversial people because they were going to get him the most views and he would only cover his friends because he wanted to help them out. But at the time, this was only the second docuseries that he'd done and so everyone still believed he had good intentions. And the series did incredibly well. It got the desired response of redeeming Jeffrey's reputation and earning both of them a hell of a lot of money. And the fifth and final episode premiered on August 9th, 2018. And between the announcement of the series and the final episode, Jeffrey gained just over 700,000 subscribers and continued to gain almost every month until May 2020. So right after the series finished, another significant event occurred in the redemption arc of Jeffree Star, which was Dramageddon 1, which this wasn't something that Jeffrey kind of started himself or anything like that, but I think even though it wasn't something he was necessarily trying to get himself involved in, it was significant in proving just how powerful Shane's series actually had been. So the tweet that kicked off all the public drama was made on August 12th, 2018, although it seemed like the situation had been brewing in the background for a long time before this. And Smokey Glow has a really great video doing a complete kind of analysis of the situation from the point of view of hindsight, which I'll link down below if you want kind of all the details, but I'm going to try and sum that up like as concisely as possible. So Manny and Jeffrey had been publicly friends since 2016 and had collabed multiple times on both of their channels, each getting millions of views from each collab. And Manny had been called out during this time for being a kind of social climber and only forming friendships for views. So people did criticize him for forming this friendship with Jeffrey because people thought he was being a bit of a suck up and only friends with Jeffrey because Jeffrey was bigger than him. And people also thought that Manny had changed a lot and gotten kind of a bit fake since getting big on YouTube, whereas Jeffrey was seen as this kind of real and authentic beauty guru, despite both of them mutually gaining from this friendship. So it's like, if it was a fake friendship, they're both gaining. It's not like one person is just gifting everything to the other person. So following the formation of the friendship with Manny, Jeffrey became more accepted into this kind of beauty community that was forming and also formed a friendship with Laura Lee and did a few collaborations with her. And Jeffrey was already friends with Nikita Dragon at this point and Nikita then introduced Gabriel to everyone and they formed this kind of little group of five. This group wasn't friends for a particularly long time, but 
because they were all top beauty gurus, they tended to have some of the same fans. So people liked to see them together. They liked to see them interact and have fun and do things together. Um, and people became invested in their friendships and seeing them collaborate because often they would be fans of more than one creator in the group and they liked seeing them together. There were mixed reactions to this friendship purely because of Jeffrey. He was a very divisive figure. He was kind of like Marmite, where you either love him or you hate him. My American viewers are probably going to have no idea what that even is, but Marmite is something that either you love it or you hate it, so just take my word for it. And some fans liked seeing these beauty gurus together and hanging out, whereas others were disappointed to see their faves openly supporting Jeffree Star. Remember, this friendship was all occurring before the Shane series, so at this point people still branded him as a racist and a lot of people didn't like him. People realised in late 2017 there was something up because these guys had not been seen together for a long time and they hadn't been posting things together but no one had really said why. Like no one in that group has made it clear why they stopped being friends but it essentially seemed like Jeffrey had been dropped from the group but the rest of them were still friends because then in April 2018 the four of them were doing clubs together without him. The series with Shane then grew Jeffrey's fan base and he was sporting a very large, very loyal, very aggressive fan base when on August 12th Gabriel Samora tweeted a photo of the four of them holding their middle fingers up with the caption it's bitter because without him we're doing better which many people took to be about Jeffrey because he they had dropped him from their group. Gabriel was accused of being mean and bullying Jeffrey unprovoked when actually it was likely a response to a part of the series where Jeffrey had talked about how toxic the beauty community is and how he'd had friends who had used and backstabbed him and betrayed him by ditching him from their group which was likely about them and the overlay shot that Shane edited onto that was a collaboration between Jeffrey, Gabriel and Nikita. So Gabriel said he posted the photo, he went to bed and he woke up to a ton of hate of people responding to his tweet. So then he responded to them by saying, imagine standing a racist, I could never. And then just kind of went about his day. They all then went out together because they were on a brand trip together and that's when they found out that old tweets and videos of theirs were being dug up by angry fans of Jeffrey who wanted to get kind of revenge on them for being like horrible to him even though they never actually mentioned him by name it was just a like a shady subtweet. So I won't go into any more detail about like what happened or the responses because I just don't think that that's relevant to Jeffrey and his kind of career path but the main point that I want to make with the situation is it showed just how quickly the public opinion about Jeffrey changed. Before Shane's series, which had concluded like three days before this tweet went out, before that series, if you publicly supported Jeffrey, you were condemned, people would attack you and be like, why are you standing him? Whereas now you were being attacked for not supporting Jeffrey. Like public opinion had done a complete 180 and suddenly people were no longer hating Jeffrey and instead they were hating people who hated Jeffrey. Like it was, it took a matter of 12 days to decide that Jeffrey Star was no longer someone who needed to be deplatformed or cancelled and instead he was someone to be protected and stand. Jeffrey didn't even need to properly respond to this because his fans were doing all the dirty work for him and cancelling these people for like daring to subtweet him and all he did was post a snapchat video of him laughing in his mansion while all of his ex-friends were being dragged to filth by his fans. He had an unbelievable amount of power in the makeup community at this point because he didn't even need to expose people himself, his fans would do it for him. Like anyone who spoke out against him, he had an army that he could send after them. Now, we don't get much happening after this. For about 10 months, Jeffrey kind of continued to exponentially grow and then rolls around May 2019 when something happened that would be one of the most significant points in Jeffrey's career, although at the time, it didn't seem like it was that big of a deal. I am, of course, talking about by sister, a situation I have discussed many times on my channel before my third ever video was a video about by sister, like, although I wouldn't re recommend anyone watches it because it's absolutely terrible, but I'm sure most of you know what happened, but I will give you a very quick overview just in case. So May 10th, 2019, Tati Westbrook uploads a 43 minute video entitled by sister, which was an expose on her longtime friend and fellow beauty guru, James Charles. In the video, Tati talks about his involvement with her rival brand, how he has treated her and others, and in particular alleges that James had, has behaved inappropriately towards straight boys, trying to force them to get romantically involved with him when he, they were not interested. 
James made an eight minute response 12 hours later in which he apologized to Tati and kind of seemed like he was admitting he was guilty. He just like sat in silence for a while. He cried, he apologized to his friends and family for like letting them down. And it was a horrible response that gave no explanation and no context for any of the situations that Tati mentioned. So everyone assumed James had no defenses and therefore he was guilty. Therefore everyone wholeheartedly believed Tati. Jeffree Star joined in on May 12th, so two days after the video came out, by tweeting in support of Tati saying, there's a reason that Nathan banned James Charles from ever coming over to our home again. There's a reason why I haven't seen him since at Glam Life Guru's birthday in February. He is a danger to society. Everything Tati said is 100% true. Nathan was Jeffrey's boyfriend at the time, so to imply that James had done something to him that warranted being, him being so uncomfortable around James that he would not let James into their home really just added fuel to the fire and turned more people against James and gained more support for Tati. And things for James were not looking good at all. Oh, and he also called him a predator on Twitter in a tweet at his brother and said he would be coming forward with receipts to prove that everything that Tati said was 100% true. James then pulled probably the biggest Uno reverse card like in the history of YouTube on May 18th, 2019, when he posted No More Lies, a 41 minute breakdown of every single allegation that Tati had made and of some private texts between himself and Jeffrey, where Jeffrey essentially accused him of exactly what he'd accused him of in public, but then threatened that the alleged victims would be joining him on camera to talk about their experiences with James. Jeffrey is known for being rather explosive when people get on the wrong side of him, but still people were not keen on how he did James in these text messages as it was indicative that Jeffrey was still the same angry impulsive person that he'd been when he was throwing insults at people on the street and that he hadn't really changed and he hadn't learned how to treat people since then. So Jeffrey posted his response video on May 19th called Never Doing This Again where he doesn't actually really talk much about what he accused James of. He only apologises for like being too impulsive and claims that from now on he will not be involving himself in any drama which people were cautious to believe because this is the second time that they'd heard this and he'd made a video like this and yet there hadn't been any change in behaviour since the first video so to believe 100% there would be change after the second time he said this would be very naive. Personally, I think that Jeffrey at this point in time knew that he got people talking about him and interested in him by getting involved in drama. So although he wanted to present himself as like the bigger person and a changed man, he could not continue his channel and continue to be successful and grow on YouTube without drama. So somehow he would continue to find himself involved in scandals, albeit it would always seem that someone else is creating drama with him rather than the other way around. This was kind of the end of that for 2019. James went back to being the biggest beauty girl on the platform and gained pretty quickly on Jeffrey and actually eventually overtook him in subscribers to become the biggest beauty girl on the platform. Jeffrey laid low for a few months after this. He didn't do anything too scandalous and I would be willing to bet that the reason for this was that he did not want anything to ruin what was already in the works. The Shane Dawson x Jeffree Star Volume 2 with the Beautiful World of Jeffree Star series, which was essentially a glorified infomercial for a collection the two of them had been working on disguised as a docuseries about the inner workings of Jeffree Star Cosmetics. To give credits where it's due, it did showcase the creative process behind making a makeup collection, which I think is why the series and the palette did so well. People who weren't watching with a critical eye didn't notice that they were being sold something. To the casual viewer, it was a documentary following the process of making a palette and a chance to see behind the scenes of the makeup industry and be part of that journey. But to any more skeptical viewers, the fact that this was basically a four hour commercial was a bit more obvious. The marketing worked well on most viewers because it was integrated seamlessly with this idea idea that this was a documentary about how a brand creates a product, it wasn't trying to sell you something. For anyone who wants to watch an actual documentary about the inner workings of the makeup industry, I would highly recommend Broken on Netflix rather than giving your time and ad revenue to anything produced by Shane Dawson. Shane basically put in the hard graph to make sure that everyone would think that Jeffrey was a good person, then reaped the benefit of that, not just through the number of views that the series got, but by producing a collection with Jeffrey's makeup brand, which at that point was at its absolute peak of sales and profits. I would be willing to put money on the fact that this was always a potential business venture in Shane and Jeffrey's mind should the first series do well and get the desired effect because Shane has never been good at making or promoting merch whereas his new bestie Jeffrey was always selling out products. 
I've already talked about the collection, some of the issues with it in my video about Jeffree Star Cosmetics, so I won't go into detail with, about that here, but the overall result was that the collection was an unprecedented success, selling an alleged 1 million units of the Conspiracy palette in the space of an hour, making both Shane and Jeffree easily $5 million each across the sales of the entire collection. If the first series hadn't happened, people would have lost respect for Shane for working with Jeffrey in the same way that they called out Kim Kardashian, who defended working with him in 2017 and got so heavily criticised that literally hours later she had to take that back and apologise. But Shane single-handedly repaired Jeffrey's reputation and restored his support and popularity, not out of the good of his own heart, but because both parties could monetarily benefit from this. And would anyone else in the makeup industry have offered a collection to Shane, someone who has never expressed any interest in makeup or ever worn makeup before this? No, the only brand I could think of is Morphe, and by 2019 people had lost a lot of trust in them to add to the fact that their products are half the price of Jeffree's, so this was Shane's only option if he wanted to benefit from the makeup industry without having to put in the hard work of getting good at makeup in order to earn a collaboration with another brand or starting his own brand. So benefit from the makeup industry Shane did until it wasn't interesting to him to be part of it anymore at which point he decided to self-combust and try and drag everyone else down with him but he only actually dragged down Jeffrey. Ironic really that the relationship that was originally incredibly valuable to both parties was then actually also the cause of both of their downfalls but we are going to come back to that in a minute. So the Shane series ended in November 2019 and Jeffrey was laying low for a while. He wasn't really doing anything noteworthy there, but there was one person from his past who kept coming back to haunt him. That person is Darvi Vanity, ex-friend of Jeffrey and supporter of his music career and also the lead singer of the rock band Blood on the Dance Floor. Darvi's band was not particularly good or revolutionary, but a lot of people who were on the emo scene in the late 2000s and early 2010s knew who they were. Jeffrey made a few songs with the band and they even went on tour together with him and Darby forming a close friendship. Allegations started to circulate in 2009 and 2010 about Darby claiming that he had been assaulting and coercing women and girls into sleeping with him and there were many women and girls claiming that this had happened to them. One survivor who now goes by the name Damien had to upload a YouTube video addressing what was happening to them because fans of Darby were sending them so much hate and threatening them for sharing their story and Darby and other band member Jay were making videos like mocking her and mocking the breakdown that she had in this video and mocking the statement that her dad made that anyone who was attacking them had done goofed. They ended up having to make an apology video and retract their accusations because of the relentless bullying that they endured from Darby and his fans. These accusations, all of them, led to Jeffrey tweeting out in August 2010 that he would no longer be associated with Darby or support Darby because of these accusations and the things that he'd seen him do when they were touring together. Notably, he said that he'd seen him take underage girls back to his hotel room and said that some of the things he'd seen were 100% illegal, which obviously backed up what these women and girls were saying had happened to them. This should have been the end of the story, especially considering some of the names that Jeffrey was calling him in the aftermath of this, but then in 2011, Jeffrey started tweeting about Darby and the music that they were going to make together and saying that they were friends, without ever explaining why he'd had this sudden like 180 turn in his opinion on Darby from the year before. So the promise of music was followed through on, they released more songs in 2012 and they actually went on tour in 2013 without ever addressing the fallout from 2010. So Darby also faced other accusations of physical and verbal abuse from 2012 from a band called New Year's Day who were kicked off of the tour with him because they stood up to him and called him out for his behaviour, with lead singer Ashley accusing him of choking her. Supposedly the reason that the band were kicked off of the tour was because Ashley had warned a young fan not to go back to Darby's tour bus with him, which he then heard about and got angry with them and decided that they weren't going to be on the tour anymore. Jeffrey continued to support Darby and in 2013 a Twitter user actually responded to a tweet about Darby asking why Jeffrey had made false allegations against him if they were friends to which Jeffrey didn't respond but Darby responded and said that Jeffrey had apologised to him in person for what he'd said. Even after this though, pe many people were still coming forward and the people who'd come forward before were maintaining that their stories were true to make a total of 21 accusers, but Jeffrey never explained why he changed his mind about Darby and the story seemingly went away until spring 2020. 
I don't know who brought this back up again but people started talking about this and there seemed to be only kind of two answers to the questions that people had which was either Jeffrey saw Darby do these things and excused his behaviour and started supporting him again anyway because it was beneficial to him or he lied about seeing these things in the first place and that's why he felt comfortable touring with them again. Chris Hansen from To Catch a Predator on NBC started to cover the situation and interviewed Damien, who was the original accuser who made that video, and then went on to interview Jeffrey about his involvement. People thought this was going to kind of finally be their chance to get the truth out and get the nitty gritty of what actually happened, but in truth, the interview left a lot of people feeling unsatisfied. Jeffrey claimed he never saw a minor alone with Darby, there was always a parent with them, and that him and Darby were never best friends. He was actually closer to Jay, the other band member, and Brandon. Andy, their violinist, and that he never personally witnessed anything happen with any minor or woman apart from inappropriate behaviour, for example, on stage, but nothing illegal. He also claimed that before their reconciliation in 2012, he checked with bandmates Jay and Brandy whether they'd seen Darby do anything illegal and they'd both said that they hadn't and that's why he signed on to that tour in 2013. Damien, the survivor that we discussed earlier, then did an interview with a channel called Pastel Bell where they claimed that Jeffrey's original tweets about Darby were because he found out about what happened to them and so his claims of ignorance were not true. He knew what that story was and that's why he said those things. And after this, despite the disappointment with Chris, the Chris Hansen interview, Jeffrey then went on the Mom's Basement podcast with Keemstar, Face Banks, and guest YouTuber Colossal is Crazy, where Colossal asked a lot of the hard-hitting questions that Chris Hansen had left out. He also didn't let Jeffrey get off lightly, like if something didn't match up, he was going to call him out about it and push for an actual answer. And in this, he reveals that there were people who said they had seen illegal things, even though he hadn't seen them himself, uh, but because the other bandmates and people close to him had then said, no, we haven't seen anything illegal, they convinced him that these other people who were saying they had were lying and that those experiences were not true because they all said they hadn't seen anything. This whole situation with Jeffrey saying that he'd made these claims without actually seeing anything happen then led people to compare this with the situation from the previous summer with James Charles where he'd never provided any evidence for what he claimed he knew had happened to victims. The host of the podcast asked him about this and he claimed that multiple people had told him things and that he'd taken their stories and ran with them which had then led to his claims that James was a predator. This was when the voice was brought up and Jeffrey said that he had evidence from a victim that James was a predator but then he tried to put the entire blame for the situation on Tati and said that he was not friends with Tati anymore whilst also saying that James thought him and Shane had been behind the whole thing which then started the rumours that it was him and Shane behind the whole thing. Before we do talk about that though I just want to say that what Darby Vanity has been accused of is absolutely disgusting and the number of victims that have come forward is not to be taken lightly and I am just astounded that this man is still walking free after 11 years of these accusations being put forward. Regardless of Jeffrey's involvement, he publicly supported a predator who should be in jail right now and he has never apologised for that. Back to what I was saying about my sister though, and the rumours that were circulating about Shane and Jeffrey's involvement in the whole situation eventually became too much and Shane Dawson snapped. June 20th, 2020, the day that Shane Dawson decided to crash and burn and take Jeffrey with him. Shane po posted a notes app essay on Twitter where, which he titled Welcome to the Circus, which was made in response to the rumours that Shane had actually en engineered the entire my sister situation with the help of Jeffrey in order to take down James Charles. In April 2020, when Jeffrey had featured on the Mom's Basement podcast, he had said to the host he was happy to play them a voice note but he could not play publicly which would be of a victim which obviously started speculation about whether or not this victim victim actually existed and whether james had gotten off lightly and spiraled people into okay who's lying what happened speculating about shane and jeffrey's involvement and in tati's involvement and who was actually responsible for everything that happened in Shane's statement, he says a number of things about what happened, about the beauty community and about Jeffrey, which actually did so much damage to Shane that it's kind of impossible to think that for some reason he thought that this would be a good idea. 
He slated all beauty gurus as being attention-seeking, game-playing, egocentric, narcissistic, vengeful, two-faced, ticking time bombs ready to explode, who are obsessed with looks, money, power, fame, screenshots and subtweets. And he said that he includes Jeffrey in this, but that Jeffrey was like family with him, so they were gonna remain friends. It's kind of strange to go off about how much you hate these traits that everyone in the beauty community has, and then excuse the one person who is the worst embodiment of every single one of these things. But like, go off, I guess. And the most incriminating things that Shane said about Jeffrey was actually that Jeffrey was annoyed with James, he was having issues with James, and he was excited to see a predator fall because he was Jeffrey f***ing star, what do you expect? Which I guess reiterates the point that I've made earlier that Jeffrey can say he's not getting involved with drama as much as he wants, but he never follows through with actions to back up his words. Like, even Shane, his best friend, was solidifying here that everyone should expect Jeffrey to be excited about drama because that's just who he is. Like, also, by Shane admitting that there was some involvement with my sister behind the scenes, regardless of what he said about Jeffrey regretting his tweets, this actually made the situation so much worse for them because up until this point, there was no admittance from either party that anything to do with my sister had anything to do with them. Like, people then started to dig up all the bad things that Shane has done, driving him off the internet for an indefinite future, although it does look like he is planning to come back fairly soon, yet Jeffrey was nowhere to be found. He did not jump on Twitter to get involved like he usually does, probably because he knew that this was not going to go well with him if he acted impulsively the same way that Shane did. Following this, Tati made her Breaking My Silence video, which essentially reinforced the fact that Shane and Jeffrey had been involved and that they had been far more involved than either of them had let on. And she basically accused them of manipulating her and gaslighting her into making the video because they were jealous of James and they wanted to see him fall. There were mixed responses to this. Some people believed Tati was being opportunistic and taking advantage of the rumours about Jeffrey and Shane to try and shift the blame to them instead, and others thought she was being genuine and finally brave enough to speak out against them because of what Shane had said, but she didn't show any evidence for what she claimed had happened, um, and she said that this was for legal reasons, so no one really knew exactly what the truth was. Jeffrey waited until July 19th to make a response to this, where he made a video titled Doing What's Right, which started off with the like to dislike ratio on but that's now been turned off because of how terrible it was where he basically says that he won't be exposing anyone or bringing any receipts and that everything was being handled behind the scenes by his lawyers. The video was a whole lot of waffle, there were a lot of vague statements, there weren't any names mentioned, only things that alluded to what he's talking about and honestly watching this video a year later at points I had to pause to really rack my brains to try and figure out what he was actually referring to which I think is the point of this response. He just not want anyone who's not clued up on the situation to become clued up by watching his video. He never mentions my sister or Shane, he just calls it the situation and says he never tried to take anyone down. So this is kind of what he does is he makes these vague videos to provide ammo to his followers so that they can then say to anyone who tries to bring this up, well, oh, well, Jeffrey addressed it, like, look at this video. He made this video and he addressed everything, but actually he doesn't really address anything. The only person mentioned by name by him is James Charles, where he says he should have gone directly to James to ask a question rather than believing everyone and getting caught up in the hype. He says he wanted to apologise James to James for the words that he said and his actions, which is such a cop-out apology because he's not saying what he wants to apologise for. This is what I mean about vague statements and to avoid incriminating himself and admitting his involvement in the manufacturing of this drama. He then goes on to deflect from the topic of the video completely and talk about how there are so many bigger issues going on that he should be worried about despite the fact that he couldn't get Elijah McLean's name right and had to dub it over, which I hate people saying stuff like this because people are allowed to use YouTube as a distraction from things that are going on in the real world. If people want to follow makeup drama because it's something petty and meaningless as opposed to the scary stuff going on in real life, then let them. Like, you can't say that people shouldn't pay attention to the dramas that you are creating when you are trying to ruin people's lives just because there's bigger things going on in the world that are more important in the context of society in general. Three things that he said in the middle of the video I want you to keep in mind because we're going to come back to them later, and that's that he's never blackmailed anyone, he's never committed a crime, and he's never been in jail. Keep that in mind. So in the latter half of the video, he talks about Shane and echoes what Shane said about this is my best friend, I'll always defend him, etc. But he does also say, me and Shane got caught up in the drama and did some dumb shit, which no elaboration, no explanation, but I think that the lack of defense speaks volumes about his actual involvement in Bi-Sister. 
So from Jeffrey Social Blade, you can see the damage that was caused by Shane's Welcome to the Circus statement because Jeffrey's first month of subscriber loss came in June 2020 and he hasn't gained any subscribers since then, but he's lost 1.8 million. In the midst of everything that was going on with Bi Sister, there were also new accusations of racism emerging. So on June 11th, just before everything that kicked off with Shane Dawson, Cameron Lester posted a 27 minute long Instagram TV video where he was talking about his experiences with Jeffrey and his brand and also with Shane Dawson. So Cameron starts off by saying how hard he works to get recognised as a black boy in the beauty community and that he'd actually been warned not to talk about his experiences because he it would be better to maintain his network than to come out about this but he decided to talk about it anyway because he would feel inauthentic if he didn't particularly with all the protests going on about racism at that time. Cameron said he had been part of one campaign for Jeffree Star Cosmetics and he had actually supposed to be part of a second one but at the last, last minute Jeffrey replaced him by his ex-best friend which he interpreted to be a message from Jeffrey to say I can replace you as a black boy at any time and he also said that while he was grateful for Shane promoting him Shane posted him as one of his like favorite small artists on June 4th he felt like they were giving him breadcrumbs in order to prevent him from taking any major action to expose them because then they could fall back on it and say well we promoted you we put you in the promotional shoots and you're just going to repay us by doing this there were also questions put to him about what he thought of James Charles by both of them, to which he responded by saying that James had always been supportive of him and Jeffrey to that replied, well, you don't owe him forever, which stood the pot a little bit about what was going to happen with my sister speculation, because remember at this point, Shane had not made his statement and I know the timeline is a little bit messed up here, but I wanted to get like all the Bi Sister stuff out of the way in one go. So that's why we're talking about this now instead. He also said he proposed to Jeffrey that he should apologize to Jackie Ina for what he said. Cause remember he never apologized to her directly. He just made his vague like racism video and never directly apologized to her. And he told Jeffrey it would mean a lot to the black community if he would apologize to Jackie. Uh, but Jeffrey shut that down and said that she did not deserve a spot on his platform, which shows that he still was not interested in privately or publicly resolving this if it was not causing him any issues. Like he was content to sweep this issue of racism under the rug and say he apologized in 2017 when actually he never apologized to her. Like if this was not causing him a problem, he did not feel the need to apologize for it, which I think speaks volumes about how much he actually learned about racism from being called out about it. Cameron ended his video by saying that he would no longer be the token black boy who was just there to make someone look good or speak up for them when the relationship there does not consist of mutual respect. Jeffrey then sent Cameron a voice note which was leaked where he basically said that he manipulated the story because he was upset that his boyfriend left him and people were attacking him for supporting Jeffrey which I will play that voice note for you now. Um, I know you're upset. Your boyfriend left you. He stopped loving you. Your roommate moved out. Um, you attacked Fenty, they didn't respond, and now people are coming for you for supporting me. So you're trying to flip the script and make up a bunch of lies and make me the devil? That is the most craziest, manipulative, most insane thing I've ever heard. So Cameron then responds and said, it's Jeffrey trying to spin this narrative that everyone wants to lie about him and make him out to be the bad guy and essentially say that Cameron was lying because he was upset about other things so he wanted to attack Jeffrey. And it's like, for some people, yeah, maybe you could believe that, but when there are so many people who have spoken out about you, it's likely that you are the problem, not them. Uh, he doesn't ever directly address this or the accusations about what he said about James Charles or Jackie Ina, and instead just uploads a video 10 days later called First Date Does My Makeup where his first date is a black man. People took this as him somehow trying to prove that he's not racist and deflect these accusations against him, but it didn't work because the lover interest in the video, Josea Flores, is a known actor. So the consensus pretty quickly became that Jeffrey had probably hired him for a PR stunt to prove like he's not racist, he's going on a date with a black man, especially since this guy has never appeared in any other video or been really mentioned ever again. So either he was contracted for just the one video or it was a really terrible first day. So this video has 299,000 likes to 92,000 dislikes. So it does have a lot of likes, but the comments are turned off. So I think that's indicative of just how positive the response was generally. So the fact that all of this happened right before his doing what's right video, and yet it wasn't addressed in that video at all, 
kind of shows how Jeffrey will only address something if it's beneficial to him to talk about it. He talked about Black Lives Matter in that video and how we should be worrying about the issues of racism in the world rather than petty YouTube drama, and yet he doesn't ever address his own personal accusations of racism that have been made to him only a month before this. Like, he doesn't feel like bringing up those accusations is beneficial in any way because if people aren't talking about it then there's no need for him to address it. Like, he doesn't address, address his own issues of racism and yet he preaches to all of his fans that they should be worrying about the general issue of racism in society. Like, you can't preach to your fans about how much of a widespread and ingrained problem racism is if you aren't willing to address your own personal contributions to that problem. Jeffree Star can make as many of these apology videos as he wants, but if they are never followed up by genuine change, then people will never believe what he's saying. Another thing that happened in June was a Twitter user on June 16th tweeted at Jeffrey a photo of a kind of website from a few years ago, which featured Jeffrey with the words lipstick Nazi and the picture of a photoshopped on top of him and Jeffrey did address this on his snapchat saying that back in the 2000s the word Nazi was used to kind of as a slam slang term so he created the lipstickmussy.com website with the intention of posting like a load of crazy photos of himself on there and he said he should have understood the offense behind the term and not used it and it is disgusting and uh, he didn't address the swastika on the photo only the use of the term See, comparing a photo of yourself photoshopped with a swastika on it to an episode of Seinfeld from the 1990s where someone who liked cooking was referred to as a soup those two are not the same thing. That photo needed addressing but as usual Jeffrey kind of twisted the narrative and just went for the one thing that he could address because if he didn't have an excuse for something it gets conveniently left out of the apology slash explanation videos. This whole apology just kind of added to everything that was mounting against him and the fact that he only addressed it on Snapchat and not in his actual apology video in July is an example of trying to make sure that only your biggest fans see these kind of things so that they then have ammunition that if someone comes for you about it they can say no but he did address this, he addressed it on his Snapchat because if he addressed it on his Instagram or his Twitter it would reach a much larger, larger audience than it would on his Snapchat so it kind of gives his biggest fans an excuse to defend him but doesn't spread what's happened to more people than necessary. So following all of this controversy in June, D'Angelo Wallace began a three-part series of all the culprits involved in Bye Sister, the first video being dedicated to Jeffrey. This video was posted on July 5th, 2020 and has nearly 10 million views and 424,000 likes to only 9.2 thousand dislikes, so clearly a lot of people agreed with what he was saying. The video was not just a recount of everything that happened with Bias Sister, instead it was a 40 minute long expose of every single thing that Jeffrey had lied about throughout his career. D'Angelo brought to light a lot of things that people hadn't really thought about or like hadn't widely questioned before this, such as his warehouse robbery in 2019, and it really opened people's eyes to how much Jeffrey had been faking or lying all throughout his career and really started to question his integrity. Remember, he came up because people saw him as like real and authentic and honest and then here's someone listing all the reasons why he is not any of those things. So D'Angelo essentially put together a timeline of all of Jeffrey's lies such as that his warehouse was robbed of two million dollars worth of product despite the fact that the LAPD never published a report about it when they actually did republish a report when Anastasia Beverly Hills had a similar robbery the year before and exposed him for never following through on any of the promises that he makes in his apology videos such as that he wouldn't be clapping back at people anymore and then going on to tell the CEO of Dolls Kill that he hoped she got hit in the face with a rubber bullet but not supporting the protests in May 2020. This video basically confirmed people's suspicions that he hadn't actually changed and everything he'd said in that first Shane Dawson documentary was a lie. He hadn't changed, he wasn't a better person than he was years ago and he'd basically just been given a redemption arc because Shane was friends with him and liked him and gave him this documentary to make him look like a good person. Whilst there was, this was only one video of many that were made at the time because of everything that was going on with Tati and Shane and James, this was in my opinion the most significant video because it didn't just expose him for what he was doing in the present day, it went into detail of everything that had led up to this and everything that he had gotten away with unscathed in the past because of this image that Shane Dawson had given him. 
and it gave him a not so flattering timeline of everything he'd done wrong during his career that then people could reference and say actually I'm not sure I want to support this person because of this this and this. Having all of this information compiled into one place was ex incredibly damning to Jeffrey and his reformed image because while you can kind of lie away little things and individual scandals having all the proof of all of these kind of little white lies in one place kind of brings the facade crashing down for anyone who's not a Jeffree Star stan with blinkers on. Like there were of course people who did not either care to watch the video or care what was being said because they were so loyal to Jeffree that they really could not see him doing any wrong but for the rest of us it made it pretty obvious that there were better people out there to be supporting than Jeffree Star. 2020 just kind of really was not very good for Jeffree because again in October he got called out for something really quite different. So trigger warning, we are talking about SA here, so please skip to the timestamp on the screen if you don't wanna hear about any of that. So October 1st, Insider posted an article in the same vein as the David Dobrik one that they would then go on to post in March 2021, but with unfortunately less widespread outrage. This article detailed many instances of SA or questionable behavior that Jeffrey had committed from his MySpace days, including groping men without consent, using a stun gun to hurt or intimidate people, and one specific story involving a 17-year-old homeless boy who had rejected his advances a year before and was staying at Jeffrey's house as a friend when they went to the movie theatre he rejected Jeffrey's advances they then came home Jeffrey intoxicated him on Am Ambien which is a sleeping pill usually used to treat people with insomnia and then threatened him with a taser and performed non-consensual sex on him what's interesting is that insider contacted Jeffrey's attorney for comment after finding all of this out and they denied all allegations uh, even though there were multiple people who had corroborated every single one of these stories and after the attorney was made aware of the stories multiple people who had confirmed the allegations then rang insider and said that they wanted to change their stories two of the sources then also provided text messages discussing a possible ten thousand dollar deal with jeffree star and his lawyer for them to recant their stories whilst two other witnesses and the boy who had been 17 at the time recanted their stories completely these text messages were obtained because the teenager who had made the accusation had sent a text message to another witness saying that Jeffrey had agreed to pay him $10,000 if he would recant his story. Jeffrey also deleted a tweet from that time that confirmed that he had been at the movie theatre with that boy on the date that they said he was there. And Jeffrey has never, never addressed any of these accusations of SA or physical assault against him, despite there being footage of him groping a man on stage in 2009, which his attorney passed off as him and a friend jokingly touching one another even though the man in the video visibly pushes him away after Jeffrey gropes him. A former Walk Tour stage manager also alleged that he'd seen Jeffrey grope both men and women and that that was part of his stage act and that's why they had to stop booking him on performances after that because he kept calling up young looking fans to the stage for sexually charged encounters. All of this, plus the amount of people who spoke to Insider about their own stories that I just don't have time to go over absolutely everyone, points to Jeffrey using his fame and his money to try and erase his past actions and intimidate and pay people into silence, which come back to what I said earlier about him saying he's never committed a crime and he's never blackmailed anyone. He might not have blackmailed anyone, but he certainly has paid people hush money to stop talking about him. There were multiple people who corroborated every detail of the stories about him and I will link the insider article down below if you want to read that for yourself so you can read the stories in full but the fact that there were so many witnesses to everything is indicative of who is telling the truth here. The fact that Jeffrey has essentially gotten away with everything whilst David Dobrik faced like internet-wide outrage following an insider article detailing similar activity is proof of just how powerful he is online. He has so much money and so many fans that at this point I'm not sure if what he would not be able to get away with which is quite scary. His following has been declining so it is going down slowly but it's going so slowly that it's going to take years and years for him to ever face any real consequence for anything that he's done. So one last thing that I just want to mention that would have been part of the video about Jeffree Star Cosmetics but I want to mention it here because I think it links to him causing outrage and creating drama to try and get attention for him and his brand is the release of the Pink Religion collection. Jeffree is no stranger to controversial branding for his collections with the cremated and palettes sparking outrage on their releases which I have talked about before but the Pink Religion collection felt a little bit like a last-ditch attempt to regain some hype and some relevancy around his brand. 
The reason I say this is because whilst his past few releases have been popular amongst his fans, they have not been nearly as hyped as things like Blood Sugar and Blue Blood were back in 2017 and 2018 when Jeffrey was at the height of his popularity. Because of this decline, it almost feels like Jeffrey has been trying to regain his relevancy by naming his palettes and his collections things that he knows are going to get people riled up and get people annoyed and get people talking about it, which will then spread the news of the release further. So Pink Religion is an all pink palette, but the use of religion in the branding has offended some Catholic people who do not like that their religion is being used as an aesthetic or a way to promote products, particularly with Jeffrey dressing up as a priest in the outfits for some promo photos. With any other brand, I'd be more inclined to say that they just didn't think about the impact on religious groups when deciding the branding, but with Jeffrey and his history of behaviour, which most definitely does not fit within the teachings of any religion, it seems more like a way to rile people up and build interest around his brand again. Like, I personally am not religious, so this doesn't offend me, but I'll put some screenshots on the screen of what people have been saying about their feelings of this whole collection. There has been some counterpoints to this about people being upset, particularly with the fact that the Met Gala theme for 2018 was Heavenly Bodies, which fo focused on Catholicism and saw celebrities dress up in Catholic-inspired outfits without being Catholic themselves. And there was backlash to that from conservatives and Catholics alike, particularly about the idea of Catholic dress being sexualized for what is essentially a very exclusive party. And I guess kind of the minor difference here is that here the imagery is being used to sell a product. Like, I don't think I personally would want to be involved with any event or product that is using religious imagery without being religiously inclined. But again, I'm not like an A-lister with an invite to the Met Gala and I am also not a beauty brand owner, but I just thought I would throw that in here because it seems like Jeffrey's collections have kind of been hitting more and more nerves each time he releases something, which could be an indication that the brand is just losing its kind of sparkle, it's losing traction and they're just trying desperately to kind of grasp at straws to get people interested in them for whatever reason. Like he says the collection sold out, but he never actually says how many units there are. So like I could release something that has one unit and then like my mum buys it and I could say like, oh, my collection sold out. You know, if you don't know how many units they're producing, you can't say how successful a collection is. Like I have not seen anyone outside of his fan base excited for one of his releases for a very long time. Not at least since the conspiracy collection two years ago. My final thoughts, honestly, I've said this before, but Jeffree Star has a huge amount of power on YouTube and on the internet general, mostly because of his unwavering cult of fans and his stacks of money that he uses to get his own way. Like people are and always have been scared to speak out against him for fear of what he or his fans might do to them because he will send an angry mob after everyone, not just other celebrities or people with platforms. Like if you're an ordinary person speaking out against Jeffree Star, he will clap back at you if you offend him enough. I am glad that people are seeing through the facade of Jeffree Star and realising that he is not and has never been a good person. He's never spread good, mes good messages on his platform and he's never reformed himself from the behaviours that he was exhibiting years and years ago. And yet he's never faced any true consequences for his behaviour. Like he's not like Tana Mojo where you watch her old videos and you can kind of see an ordinary girl who is not anything like the Tana that we know today. And you can kind of see a glimpse of her being like an ordinary person with good morals, unlike what she is now. With Jeffrey, he's always been like this and he spent 15 years curating this image and being known for this. So the chance of any change at this point is minimal, regardless of how many vague apology videos he makes. Thankfully, Shane Dawson no longer has the power to give him a redemption arc whenever he needs one. And at most commentary and drama channels are on the same page that Jeffrey is not someone to be promoted or supported and they don't like him. But it's just wild to think how many people were fooled just because of a four hour series about him. Like how many people were fooled into thinking that his behaviour had truly changed when he never made any changes to what he was doing or how he was behaving, he just hid it behind the scenes instead. And the fact that everything is happening behind the scenes now is making people more scared to speak out about him because there's no hard evidence of it. Like he is very good at hiding his tracks and making sure that things aren't recorded, they aren't on record and people can't use them against him. So anyone who speaks out against him faces the angry mob of fans without any proof to, sh to show them to say like, no, he actually did do this. 
Jeffrey currently has 16.3 million subscribers, so even after everything that's happened, he still has a huge platform and a ton of followers, so it really seems like he's uncancelable at this point. Like, I don't know what would need to happen for the internet to be rid of Jeffree Star, but I just hope that this video has given you guys enough of an insight as to why I personally do not like Jeffree Star, I do not want to support Jeffree Star, and hopefully you guys will hold that same opinion after hearing all of this. There have been some things that I haven't gone into like too much detail to, like his music and some things that I haven't really mentioned, like the Trisha Paytas Vegas trip drama and all of that, because either the points that I would make about that have been made in a different section and there wasn't really any need to repeat them, but just know that those things happened or they're just not significant enough. But you know, those things did happen and it's just something that I did not have time to talk about here because I've talked about so much other stuff that I didn't want to bring things up that weren't really necessary or that weren't really very significant in his career journey or haven't really had much of an effect on him. And I didn't just, I just didn't want things to take up space in this already 13,000 word script that weren't going to be particularly important. So finally, we are at the end. That is everything that I have to say on the rise and downfall of Jeffree Star. This was probably the most difficult timeline to piece together just because there are so many things that are relevant at multiple points. Oftentimes when there was a lot of stuff going on at the same time, so it's like, what order do you talk about this in when you need to link this thing to this thing, but you also need to link this thing to this other thing. Like there was a lot of stuff that happened ages ago that then came back to bite him like years later so this was an absolute nightmare to try and put things in like a vague chronological order and on top of that there is just so much stuff that needed to talk about hence why this video is actually probably going to be my longest video ever and it's going to be a lot so if you have made it this far then Thank you. This video took a lot of hours of research, planning, editing and filming. So if you did enjoy, then please leave a like down below so that I know that I haven't wasted all of the time and that it actually was worth watching. Leave a comment if you have any thoughts on Jeffrey, on anyone that you would like to see covered in the series next and subscribe if you want to see more videos like this. I will also link in the corner my playlist of all of my other rise and downfall of videos if you want to go and watch any of them. I will hopefully see you guys in the next one. Bye guys.